and we are live right so i'm gonna wait a few minutes before starting with the session so let me get this sorted and we will start in a few minutes Right, I guess I'll just start right away. It doesn't matter if we don't have people joining yet. Uh, those who are watching, those who are here live, uh, thank you for joining. But those who are play, playing back this video in, on a later time, I, I hope that this session would be a, a blessing to all of you. But more than that, welcome to ev uh, welcome everyone. Peace of Christ to all of you. And today we are going to look at uh the second it, this is the second session that i'm doing on the gospel according to matthew right so if you have been uh, uh if you've been joining my sessions prior to this uh at the moment i'm going through the book of matthew verse by verse at times verse by verse at times we're going to go through passage by passage and in the last session we looked at uh, basically we, we were laying down the foundation to understand the book of Matthew. So we were looking at things such as uh, the authorship, in regard to the authorship, uh, we, we looked at uh, earlier evidences from the early church fathers, whether they understood it that Matthew indeed wrote this gospel. We were also looking at uh, the, the, the theme of the book of Matthew in itself. So I, I hope that session was helpful. If you haven't watched this, uh, the, the first session, please do go and watch that as well. I hope that would be a blessing to you as well. Right, so in this session, we would be looking at Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Just one verse, but I believe that the beginning of Matthew, there are a lot of things that we often skip and often uh, we often don't take time to understand the implications of it that would affect the way we understand the rest of the gospel so in this session we are going to focus primarily on matthew chapter 1 verse 1 it's a very short verse but uh, obviously it's not we are not going to look at that very verse alone but because matthew is speaking to the jewish people at that time we are also going to be looking at the Old Testament because Matthew is alluding to the Old Testament in most of his passages and, and he goes on to say that Jesus fulfills the laws and the prophets. Jesus fulfills this prophecy. So Matthew is using the Old Testament to justify the person of Jesus Christ, whether his humanity or his divinity. Therefore, though we even though we are only studying verse one of Matthew chapter one, we are going to look at book like in the book of Genesis. We are going to look at Chronicles. We're going to look at Kings. Uh, we're going to look at book of Samuel. We, basically, by the end of studying Matthew, uh, we would probably be going through all of the Old Testament books one way or another, right? So, in that sense, I believe that though this is a Bible study. On Matthew we will be looking at other passages as well uh, not only in the Old Testament but also in the New Testament in regard to the synoptic Gospels uh, the, the epistles and and so forth now before we before I start with the session I mean we have already started the session but before I go any further I thought let's just start with a word of prayer Heavenly Father we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We pray a lot for this session. We pray that this session would be a blessing to all of us. Uh, we pray, save us from error. Save us from uh, misunderstanding your word, Lord. 
guide us, move our hearts and mold us so that we may understand your word and live out your word. All glory and honor and praise to you in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. In Jesus name. Amen. Right. So, we would start in would start the in Matthew chapter 1 verse 1. So, what does Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 actually say? Right? I'll just read it. Matthew chapter 1 verse 1. I'm reading the New American Standard Bible. You can use the translations that you are common with. It says here, The record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Maybe I can read it in another version. For example, King James, it says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's the reason why I started with the New American Standard Bible, because it emphasizes on the title that was given to Jesus, Messiah. We often call Jesus as Jesus Christ, so much so that sometimes we we think that Christ in itself is, is his name. But nevertheless, Christ in itself, that, that tit- it's, it's a title rather than a name. His name is Jesus but we call him Jesus Christ because we are affirming that Jesus is the Messiah. So that's why I started with the New American Standard Bible to emphasize on this. And that's why I titled this session as the long-awaited Messiah or uh, as you see in my thumbnail, Messianic Expectations. So what we are going to look at throughout this session is what were the expectation of the people at that time in regard to to the Messiah, right? What were they expecting? Uh, who were they expecting to come? What kind of Messiah they were expecting to come? So these are the questions that I have in my mind when when I read this in regard to Matthew actually writing this towards a majority Jewish population at that time, right? What was he trying to? Uh, how was he trying to justify that Jesus is the Messiah? What were the people's understanding of? the Messiah who is about to come and and more than that as we see here it goes on to affirm not only that Jesus is the Messiah he goes on to say that Jesus is the Messiah the son of David the son of Abraham obviously this is speaking of God's covenant with Abraham and David which leads us back to The question of Messiah and the expectation of the Messiah to come. What were they really expecting? What kind of person they were really expecting to come? So Matthew, when he starts his gospel in that that way, I believe that the very purpose of the genealogy in itself is very specific to answer that question. The question of who is the Messiah? And Matthew starts by affirming that Jesus is is the Messiah. He is indeed the Messiah. He is the son of David, son of Abraham. And then he goes on to give the genealogy. In this session, I'm not going to go through the genealogy yet. That will be the next session. I'll start with the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and uh, Jacob. And then we'll look at the other parts of the passages. Uh, From then on, I'll be probably going through a few verses at a time. There are a lot of things to look at. I guess one of those, uh, one of the the dangers of 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 going through the genealogy is that one of it is that most of us often just skip altogether everything. You know, it's just it's just a genealogy. It just shows that Jesus is from the lineage of David and Abraham, and that's it. And we we most of the time we skip it. In fact, when I read the Bible in the early years of of mine, I I, I, I just skip it. I, I never actually read it and try to understand it. But the flip side of it is that we can study it in the sense that we, we overanalyze it to the sense that we try to make meaning out of the text where the text is not saying such things. Right? So, for example, it says... In, in, in if you read if you have read Matthew chapter 1 it would go on to say that this genealogy is broken down to three sets of 14 generations 
and this 14 generations these three sets of 14 generation leads you to that question why did matthew break it into this three sets of 14 generations and and you have a lot of questions that there are a lot of legit answers to it but also in that in this in that same sense i believe that there are also uh, there are also ways that we can over analyze it and misunderstand the text all by itself so i i want to be careful in that sense as well so if i if i explain something that i'm not 100% sure of i will definitely let you know but that's all for the coming sessions that we are going to go through now back focusing on matthew chapter 1 verse 1 the whole idea of the genealogy matthew starts by saying that jesus is indeed the messiah he starts by affirming that So now we will look so what I'm going to do now I'm just going to we're going to break down this passage, this very verse into few parts and we're going to try to understand it part by part right and in that way we would I believe you'll have a better grasp of the very verse and then we will have a better understanding of the genealogy in itself the very first thing that we want to look at is this the record of the genealogy pretty straight straightforward it's a record and what record is it it's a record of genealogy a lineage of a certain person and who is that person the person is jesus who is jesus he is the messiah is the messiah he is the son of david he is the son of abraham so we are going to look at these three things jesus being the messiah what it means for Jesus being the messiah what was the expectation of the people at that time in regard to this coming messiah and then we will look at these two covenants the covenant of god with david and the covenant of god with abraham and how that relates to jesus and how that relates to us as well so we're going to understand that uh, something that's neat as well in regard to this uh, to the beginning of this book when you understand when you read this when it says the record of the genealogy of jesus it simply means the record simply means a book or a lit- literal written record of the genealogy also the word used uh, here the actual the actual greek word used used here is biblos so if you were to uh, right for example you can see here this is the actual greek word that's used here so if you ever wonder uh, you know if if the book that we have here is called the bible i mean where do we get this from right as you've seen here the whole idea of the bible is a written record it's a collection of books so the whole idea when we call this book the holy bible it's a written record of of the canon of all the books that that is deemed to be scripture right so that's that's what it's all about right biblos means bible it means record and now when we start the book of matthew the whole idea matthew is starting on he's saying that this book that he's writing this record that he's writing is about the genealogy of jesus the messiah so i'm not going to over explain this which i've already done it <laughs> done it now um speaking about genealogy uh, the question arises is that why matthew actually uses a genealogy Uh, the question also arises whether is genealogy only about lineage is it only about saying that you know who is the father of this person and the ancestors of this person is that the only reason we find genealogy being used throughout scripture in fact it actually makes sense for matthew to start in this way because uh, as we have you know in the last session that we have gone through that matthew was writing to a majority of jewish audience and in the old testament genealogies are quite often found in the text we find this in the book of uh, genesis the book of uh, chronicles we see a short genealogy of uh, david in ruth uh, book of ezra and we have a few examples of that so we maybe we should just l- briefly look through this genealogy just to understand it for example in genesis 5 right Genesis 5 we find the descendants of Adam here it says this is the book of the generations of Adam seems like a same 
the same phrasing of Matthew chapter 1. In, in, instead there it uses this genealogy of Jesus here it says this is the book the book and record it's it's anonymous it's the same thing right this is the book of the generations of adam in that day when god created man he made him the likeness of god uh it goes on to right so he starts here then the days adam after he became the father of seth were 800 years and he had other sons and daughters so all the days that adam lived were 930 years and he died and seth 150 105 years and became the father of enosh then seth lived 807 years after he became the father of enosh and he had other sons and daughters so all the days of seth were 912 years and he died and he goes on and on and on in that same format right up to the point of noah and then he starts the story of Noah, the corruption of mankind at that time and basically the, the start of the account during the time of Noah and the Noah's flood. Now, this is, this format is pretty, pretty specific to this passage alone. We don't find this in other passages, the other ge- uh, genealogies. In this genealogy, we find the genealogy from Adam, the first man, right up to Noah. That's the first thing. So we find the genealogy is between that time frame. Number two, we also see that in this text, the years of the person, uh, the, 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 the amount of years this person lived is, is mentioned. That's one. Another, another fact that we find here is the time that he had his offspring. So what were the reasons for including the, this, this time frames? in the genealogy when genealogy was all is all about having this written account of the of the lineage right so one way could be you know one way to understand this is that all right maybe these are the these are the ways that we can measure the number of years uh, these people lived how long was this duration between adam and noah from knowing this number of years we can know that I also understand that not everyone believes in a literal understanding of this passage as well. Not everyone have a literal understanding of creation as well. Most, uh, especially traditional uh, Christians, Orthodox Christians, we truly believe that the uh, when you talk about creation, the six days of creation, God indeed actually had six literal days of creation. But there are also views where it says that these six days are not necessarily six actual days, but it has a deeper meaning to it. Same goes to this very passage. Some may say that they actually at that time lived that long. Right? I tend to uh, hold to that view. But there's also people who have different views saying that these numberings have different meanings to it as well. So there are several views, but nonetheless, the reason these numbers are there is to point out to the reader at that time, at least to the, to, to the immediate audience at that time, a certain meaning to it. So it was not only about lineage, but there's also other aspects tied to it as well. That's all I'm trying to, to, to show here, right? I'm not, we are not going to, to go into detail here because my primary, 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 primary goal is to study Matthew chapter 1 verse 1. So we find that this genealogy is more than just a lineage. It's something else, right? There are more to it. Let's go to Numbers 3. Here we find uh, a lineage of, of Aaron. It's a very short lineage where these are the names of the sons of Aaron, Nadab, the firstborn, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. These are the names of the sons of Aaron, the anointed priest whom he ordained to serve as priest. So it goes on to say that this ironic, this, rather than it's just a form of lineage, it find, we find that this priesthood runs in this lineage. So there's this parallel understanding about genealogies as well. It's, it's not only talking about somebody's offspring or somebody's lineage, but it's also speaking about their heritage in, in that sense. Let's look at chronic, Chronicles. Uh, I guess Chronicles is a bit too long to go through the whole thing. Yeah, why did I, why it came this, all right. So in Chron, 
what okay so in chronicles uh, i'll look I'll, i'll show you another um, a diagram that i've i've prepared just to give you a picture of it maybe later on because we are going to study the book of samuel book of samuel and chronicles later on so there's some things that i've got to show you but in regard to genealogy what i want to point out here is that the book of chronicles is written f- uh far later than the book of samuel and kings right if you have read samuel kings and chronicles if you read the whole old testament you find you will find that samuel kings and chronicles have parallel passages that 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 speak about same events that you can find this in 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 the book of samuel kings and chronicles when you start reading these three books you'll realize there are certain things that are written in chronicles that are not written in kings but some are written in chronicles uh, some are not, not written in chronicles but written in kings right you, you would find that it complements one another right it completes one another so in the book of chronicles rather than the book of samuel and kings in chronicles it starts by the genealogy and it goes way back to the beginning why because the very book of chronicles is written far later it's during the time of the the post exilic period or basically when the jewish people israel was taken into uh, captivity in babylon after the time of kings after they were there in in babylon they there was a time that they came back and that's when the book of chronicles is written to so in, in in fact it's a time where they when they wrote the chronic the book of chronicles is to remind back the audience at that time the post exilic audience of this people a summary of their beginning of their heritage and it starts with adam uh, something that is that you will also realize in the book of chronicles have have a very specific focus in the lineage of judah and david for a very obvious reason because they were expecting a king they were expecting a, a kingdom that lasts forever right because of that the last kingdom that did not last they understood that they that god always keeps his covenant god always keeps his covenant and they remembered that covenant that god had with david so in in a sense one of the reasons for the book of chronicles or one of the aspects that we find in the book of chronicles is to remind back the reader regarding this promise that god had and it when he goes back right up to adam right and he talks about the uh, the lineage of david right there's a uh, there's a focus on the lineage of david um and and the kingdom of juda rather than israel as you know after the time of solomon the kingdom split into two the northern and the southern kingdom the promise was the promise of that uh the promise of kingship the, the kingdom has always been in the line of juda which is the southern kingdom right so chronicles focused on that whether in rather in kings in the book of kings you find both those uh kingdoms you find passages speaking about the kings of both those kingdoms whereas chronicles focuses primarily on the line of david right so here the genealogy starts from adam and it goes right up to the day right up to david and his lineage as well the 12 tribes of israel and so for so forth right so i'm not going to go into detail because this is quite long it's just all names i i believe that a lot of us skip this as well but again what was the reason for the, for the writer of chronicles to to put all of this genealogy was it just a record of the lineage of the people or it's a reminder to the people regarding god's covenant god's promise for his people and and all the other thing there are a lot of other aspects that come to 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 the genealogy rather than just being a record of genealogy right so genealogy in itself is a tool used to bring out draw out meaning or understanding of certain aspects of of their history of the maybe the of of the politics in israel and and so forth right so the genealogy in itself is not just a lineage in itself there are more things to it rather than lineage and in fact it's used as a method to draw out these meanings let's see the book of ruth maybe i'll skip ruth or should i see ruth it's right at the end of ruth if i'm not mistaken right so it's this whole idea is to to remind the reader of the lineage of david where the lineage of david started from i'm going to go through the book of ruth on 
in the maybe in two sessions from now because we are going to look at the significance of the four women well actually there's no that's not four women in the genealogy uh, we will look at that later on but uh, when it comes to the name of ruth we are going to study briefly the book of ruth so uh, at that time we will look more deeper but the at the end of the book of ruth we find a short genealogy as well in the book of ruth the whole idea of this genealogy is to show the lineage of david where david came from that david uh and his lineage right david his father is jesse and then obed and salmon and we find this names again written in matthew chapter 1 one of the things that i want to highlight as well the genealogy there are times where matthew deliberately skips one or two names right we will look at that as well in in the future sessions just something that i want to highlight if you were to look at each name specifically and go back to the old testament and see the lineage there and try to match it back you'll start to realize wait a minute he's he skipped a few names just to make sure that he has three sets of 14 so in that sense he was deliberate in the way he formatted his genealogy in matthew chapter 1 so here in ruth the very specific purpose of this genealogy is to show the origins of david where did he come from who was his heritage where where did he come from right the book of ezra chapter 7 this is interesting it starts here by saying now after these things in the reign of artaxerxes king of persia there went up ezra son of seraiah son of azariah son of hilkia son of shalom son of zadok son of ahitu son of amaria son of azaria son of mera merayot son of zerahia son of uzi son of buki son of abishua son of phineas son of eliaza son of aaron the chief priest now the question i'm going to ask here is was this the whole idea of this genealogy was it just to show that ezra Ezra's lineage to to show you that this is his father and his grandfather and his great grandfather was this the only purpose rather we find that the genealogy stops at Aaron and he goes on to emphasize that Aaron is the chief priest so it goes on to in a way it says that Ezra as a scribe and a priest it goes on to say in verse 6 this Ezra went up to Babylon and he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses so being a scribe being a priest he was not someone who just came up in his family to do this this was something in regard to his heritage right in in the time of israel the families were specific in the way they do things in the way they in 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 their place in society and when it comes to aaron his offsprings were priests and ezra in the sense of Ezra showing his lineage here is going to show that his pedigree as being a bona fide skilled scribe that he is not just someone out of nowhere in fact he has a heritage of skilled uh, heritage of priest uh, from his lineage goes to show that he is not just any just just any person who's writing this but he's far more than that right it emphasizes certain things certain aspects or attributes of this person called Ezra right so i guess that's enough in regards of uh genealogies we go back to matthew chapter 1 so we find that genealogies in itself when you when you, when when matthew is using this he's using a very common method of writing of the jewish people the jewish people when they were they, if they were to read this i believe that they would have a clearer understanding than probably a modern christian right because the idea or the method of writing this it's not unique on i mean sorry it's not new rather it's a unique way of writing based on the old testament if we just read the old testament we can see the genealogies were commonly used to one show lineage but two also show other aspects to the storyline to add to add to the idea of uh the the you know what were the 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 political or the religious aspect or the domestic aspect you, you know you you will understand more through the genealogy rather than just being a lineage 
so there are other aspects tied to it as well so when it comes to matthew chapter 1 now the question comes what was what is matthew trying to teach here and i've already as i've gone through the whole idea is in verse 1 Matthew actually says why he is writing this genealogy is to show that Jesus is the Messiah according to the to the covenant to David and Abraham the son of David the son of Abraham because let's just even talk about son of Abraham all Jews claim claim Abraham to be their father they are all sons of Abraham so what's so specific of about Jesus calling to be called as the son of Abraham to be affirmed to be the son of Abraham there has to be there is a greater emphasis here that Jesus is not just a son of Abraham but he is the son of Abraham who is the messiah he is not he is the very messiah that they were waiting for right we would go through uh, in regard to the son of Abraham son of David in a short while but now we would focus on this messiah we have already gone through understanding genealogy uh the aspects of using genealogy to teach uh, to draw out other meanings to to the narrative but also maybe another thing that i want to ask another question that we can ask as well uh, what were the controversies going on in that at that time could it be that one of those controversies at that time that there were groups of people denying the humanity of christ or even the divinity of christ for example in regard to humanity of christ there were people who denied that jesus actually was human for example if you see in the epistles of john john himself goes on to say if anyone calls uh, says that jesus did not come in the flesh they are the son uh, they are the antichrist right so there were people at that time that had that understanding and the apostles were answering this kind of objections so could this be one of the reasons so matthew writing the whole idea of him writing the genealogy was not only to show that jesus is the messiah but he is truly born as a human right because right after this passage is about the 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 incarnation of jesus and the conception of jesus and him being born right but that's for a later date but the whole idea here is that now we are going to look at Jesus being professed as being the messiah so now the question comes uh, the question is why is jesus called the messiah what does it mean to be called the messiah the word messiah in itself simply means anointed it has a range of use in even in regard to the old testament if you were to go and search the word anointed and if it is in regard to a certain person uh, and if you see the hebrew word behind it it's the same it's a similar it's the same word if not mistaken the word is messiah messiah if not mistaken right uh, please do go and check this out as well double check on this but the whole idea is the, the 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 meaning of the word messiah in itself is to be anointed the anointed one right and this word is used in a range of ways in the old testament it used for priests it used for kings you know as kings are being the anointed even, even david is the king david is called as the anointed one right uh, the patriarchs uh, in fact even uh, king cyrus is called the lord's anointed if you find that in uh, let me see if i write that in my notes here yeah. isaiah 45 was one this thus says the lord to cyrus his anointed so this word here if you were to see masi masi here it simply it's a, it's a, it, it simply means messiah right so the even cyrus who is supposedly a pagan king but he is if if i'm not mistaken he is the king who allowed israel to to go back during the time of uh, captivity right and god uses cyrus now the understanding is on the word of messiah let me go back to matthew chapter 1 got to be distracted here right so now if messiah simply means the anointed one and matthew is using the word messiah to ascribe to jesus there has to be deeper meaning to it what what was what was jesus uh, what was matthew trying to 
teaches in regard to Jesus being the Messiah. So though Messiah, the word Messiah or anointed is used in various ways in the Old Testament, there was a very specific or a unique role of this coming Messiah as well. Because even in the Old Testament, there were passages speaking about this Messiah that is going to come that is pictured in a far glorious way. For example, in the book of Daniel that we will go through shortly, right? We see one like the Son of Man coming that and that all glory will, will be for him and all dominion will be for him and his kingdom will be forever. So there is this expectations and that's what we are going to discuss right now in the expectations of the people in regard to the Messiah. So they all understood that Messiah, though meaning just meaning anointed, it also means that uh, there is also a specific person that is written in the Old Testament, that there is this person that is going to come that they are calling the Messiah, right? And this Messiah is the one who is going to bring freedom to them. Is they are, He is the one who is going to establish a kingdom that is going to last forever in the line of David and Judah. Uh, there were a lot of expectations to this coming Messiah, right? So we will go through a few passages. Uh, before going to the passages in the Bible, I thought of looking at a few, um, a few. Uh, maybe I'll just read one, uh, one or two uh, article in regard to a certain belief that Jewish people have. For example, the Jewish people actually had, uh, at, at least at that time, they were not, they were not necessarily looking for one singular Messiah. From the understanding of the Old Testament, you have to understand that we now understand Jesus as being the Messiah as, as after the fact. Jesus has already come, he has already shown, he revealed himself, and now we are understanding that, okay, all these Old Testament passages means Jesus is the Messiah. But imagine that now you are before Jesus' arrival, before Jesus came in flesh. What were their expectations at that time? What were they expecting the Messiah to look like? And what, was, what were the expectations that the Messiah is going to do? So they had, there were people or the groups of people that had various views on Messiahship. They had people who believed that they are going to be not necessarily one Messiah, but they are going to be more than one Messiah, multiple Messiahs. There were reasons for that, right? The, the reason being, there are passages that show Messiah to be one glorious, like a king. And there are also passages showing the Messiah being one who is suffering. For example, in Isaiah, we find that a suffering, the suffering servant in Isaiah 52, 53, we find the passage about the suffering servant. They understood at that, even at that time, they understood that that passage was in regard to the Messiah. Though today, the Jews, the Jewish people, or the people who are, or who, are who are who believe in the Orthodox, uh, would, would I call it Orthodox Jewish belief or the rabbinic Jewish uh, belief of today, they would have a different view on Isaiah 53 and 52. They would say that Isaiah 52, 53, that su the suffering servant is not a singular person, but rather the people of Israel altogether. So they would have that understanding. But this wasn't the, the, the I, I believe that this wasn't the true orthodox belief of the Jewish people. They truly understood that this is the Messiah because they had this understanding that the Messiah is going to suffer as well. So they had this two understanding of this. They had these two mess messianic beliefs. They believe that there, there is a Messiah that is going to come and suffer for the people. And there is also a Messiah that is going to come and be like a king. A glorious king. So they had these two messianic ideas in, in their theology or their doctrine. right? We are going to read. Uh, this is a non-Christian uh, website. I'm just going to brief, briefly read. Uh, before that, uh, if you have heard something called the Targum, Targum is basically, how do I put it? It's basically an interpretation or, or yeah, I guess interpretation or a translation of the Hebrew text, of the Old Testament text. And there is one specific Targum called the Targum of Jonathan Ben Uziel. 
right it's it's a it's a it's a very common uh, targum that you can find online t a r g u m you can just search it on google and you can find it targum jonathan and he has of uh, his interpretation are not necessarily long they are basically sometimes ranging from one word or more just to make the verse even clearer let me just give you an example in isaiah 52 let me show you this right so this is one maybe i can share the link later on or maybe i can just share it right now right if you want to check it out you can check at the the link that i provided in the chat if you go down to isaiah 52 this is actually the passage in itself isaiah 52 but it has additional words to make clear what the passage was referring to and in isaiah 52 verse 13 it shows here behold my servant the messiah shall prosper so jonathan here this this uh this person who is learned in the in the in in the jewish text in the hebrew text or the old testament they understood that this servant that was alluding to in meth in isaiah 52 53 is speaking about the messiah because if you find in the very text you won't find the word the messiah there he is actually explaining he is making it clear who is this servant so for example if you were to go back to okay so if you were to go back to isaiah 52 13 you would just see that behold my servant will prosper he will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted this is speaking about obviously as christians we understand this to 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 point to jesus but nevertheless though today's jewish people understand it as uh, this is not speaking about the messiah in fact it's speaking about the people of israel as a whole i guess that's that could be debunked one of those reasons is the targum of jonathan ben uzia right the whole idea of the targum was to show that the people at that time understood that Isaiah 52 was speaking about the messiah that's one as i've said before this i was uh, i wanted to show you an article we'll go through a short article uh, in regard to this belief of two messiahs right let me just sorry for making this difficult i've got to see a few screens to do this right okay so here right this is shabbat.org you, you can check this out as well i can share the link to you as well uh i'll put this in the description box later but now the whole idea is there are there is this belief as well this is not a christian website right the whole the whole the idea is right now we want to understand what what are the jewish beliefs and what were they expecting right now whether this this understanding was there in right at the beginning uh, or during the time of jesus we will talk about it later right the whole idea is now we find this idea right in an a non christian uh, article this article is written in shabbat.org i believe this is a jewish website and this is the uh, uh, i would say that an article alluding to the traditional belief of the jewish people so it goes on to say jewish tradition uh, i'll briefly read it's it's not a very long passage jewish tradition speaks of two redeemers each called each one called mashiach or messiah so they believed in two redeemers or two messiahs both are involved in ushering in the messianic era they are mashiach mashiach ben david mashiach ben yosef so there's messiah ben Uh, messiah son of david messiah son of joseph right the term mashiach unqualified always refers to mashiach ben david mashiach the descendant of david of the tribe of juda he is the actual final redeemer who shall rule in the messianic age all that was said in our text relates to him mashiach ben yosef mashiach the descendant of joseph of the tribe of ephraim son of joseph is also referred to mashiach ben ephraim Mashiach the descendant of Ephraim he will come first before the final redeemer and later will serve as his viceroy 
the essential task of mashiach ben yosef is to act as a precursor to mashiach ben david he will prepare the world for the coming of the final redeemer different sources attribute to him different functions some even charging him with tasks traditionally associated with mashiach ben david such as in gathering of the exiles the rebuilding of bet hamikdash and so forth hope i didn't mispronounce that right it goes on to say the principal and final function ascribed to mashiach ben yosef is a is of political and military nature he shall wage war against the forces of evil that oppress israel more specifically he will do battle against edom the descendants of esau edom is the comprehensive designation of the enemies of israel and it will be crushed through the progeny of yosef thus it was prophesied of all the house of jacob will be a fire and the house of joseph a flame and the house of esau of for stubble this is from obadiah 118 the progeny of esau shall be delivered only into the hands of progeny of joseph so it goes on to you can continue reading but you get the idea here the whole idea here that we find that the the traditional belief of the jewish people is there are two messiahs so if the passage is speaking about the traditional belief of the jewish people i believe that this is the the belief or there were groups that believed in 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 this that there are going to be two messiahs even during the time of jesus right so this is one of those the whole idea i'm reading that though being not not a christian uh, article or a source is that to show you that there were people or group of people who were expecting a certain type of messiah so it makes sense for matthew to now write a genealogy to straighten things out to show them that wait a minute you believe in two messiahs is going to come two redeemers is going to come messiah ben of david messiah ben yosef mashiach ben david mashiach, mashiach ben yosef i'm i'm going to tell you that there's no two messiahs but there's only one messiah which is interesting as well because the genealogy of jesus the messiah goes on to say that this jesus the messiah is the son of david and son of abraham but they believed in jesus being the son of uh not jesus i mean the messiah himself is going to be a messiah ben yosef as well so there's going to be two messi- mess- uh, messiahs and matthew writes his genealogy and towards the end he says that Jesus is also the son of Joseph if you were to read at the end obviously we know Joseph is not the the you know he does not share the dna with Jesus but he is the adopted father here we find here towards the end Jacob was the father of Joseph the husband of Mary by whom Jesus was born who is called the messiah so he emphasize again that this person born through Joseph and Mary is the messiah again he it's like a book end of the genealogy he starts by saying that jesus is the messiah he ends by saying that jesus is the messiah so the question arises could could it be that matthew is writing towards a group of people that believe that jesus that the messiah the expectation that they had is that there going to be two messiahs messiah ben yosef and uh, messiah ben uh, david though that belief is not uh, it it it's it's a traditional belief rather than one uh, focused on 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 scripture they that was their interpretation of that scripture so they believe that wait a minute if there are one mess, there is going to be one messiah who is going to suffer and another one is going to come glorious definitely they are not two similar people same people they are two distinct people but they are both messiahs but the ultimate messiah is the one who is called messiah ben david but here matthew says that no Jesus is the Messiah. There's only one Messiah. He suffers he is the one who's going to suffer for us. He is the one who is going to be the king. He is the one who is the, like the son of man coming in in the clouds of heaven, glorious and all dominion is for him. Right? So that emphasis is there because he is the son of David here and towards the end it says son of Joseph not in a way to show that he is the son of Joseph but it if understanding the 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 context of that people at that time the question arises would it be one of the reasons matthew is writing this to, to show that you know to 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 tell them look you believe in two messiahs the, this is the messiah ben david and joseph but the ultimate idea here is to show that he is the fulfillment of god's covenant with david and abraham that is that is the whole idea here 
so i could be over analyzing things when it comes to jesus being called the son of uh, joseph as well in regard to that social or the the, the time uh, the people's understanding at that time i could be over analyzing that as well so please take that as you know, with a grain of salt now that is the understanding of the traditional jewish people there are also other understandings you can also look at Uh, these are things that i'm still reading through if i were to i i really uh if i were to take all of those and put it here i think it's going to take even more longer time but i can point you towards a certain uh keywords where you can search on yourself and and explore as well for example uh in the qumran caves the dead sea scrolls there were a lot of books that were fo- found during of, of the qumran people the people at that place so the caves that were that are that are going through all the 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 digging at that at, at right now they are they are getting a lot of scrolls that are not necessarily just scripture there are also other books other books there the apocrypha and there are a lot of other books as well so even in their writings we find there was an expectation of the messiah they have different views of the messiah some even believe there are more than two messiahs so there are a lot of expectations of the people in that area right and being the qumran caves being nearly 2000 years old most of the writings are even pre jesus time right so we understand by from from those books in of the or the, the scrolls that we are finding from the qumran caves we also find we also have an understanding of the mind of the people at that time so there are understandings of far more than two messiahs uh one thing that i can point to is uh something that i read yesterday i, I can't show it here yet uh, maybe on another session but there is also a, a scroll or a parchment that they found and they called it 11q13 11q13 is about uh it's it's title as melchizedek melchizedek you find this in scripture as well especially in some 110 if i'm not mistaken and also in the book of hebrews and Jesus is always shown as the one uh shown as one who is from the line of Messi, uh, Melchizedek as well. And the whole idea is to show that he's a king and a priest. Uh, have, that's a whole other topic altogether, but Melchizedek as well is seen in uh, it makes sense as well that there were other understanding there were understandings of the Jewish people at that time uh when they found this parchments 11q13 you can search that in regard to melchizedek uh there are also other written articles and journals on that very parchment and uh my current understanding i i, I may be wrong here because there are a lot of there are a lot of misinformation out there as well but there was an idea that this messiah would be in the line of melchizedek would be in the line meaning not a lineage of melchizedek but in the sense that he melchizedek itself himself is a is a picture of the messiah so the messiah is going to be a king and a priest a kingly and a priest who and a high priest to the people so they had this belief as well which makes sense because the writer of hebrews uses melchizedek so the people at that time probably had that belief that expectation as well that the messiah is going to come is not going to be a king only but is going to be a priest as well because king and priest are not necessarily two specific roles in in the in the in the intended purpose of for example adam right we only see a split between a king and a priest later on in history but the king and priest were always one person so it could also there could also be an expectation that the messiah is going to come will be the completion will be the, the complete messiah in the sense that he is a king and a priest for the people right so these are all i would say external sources that we can see in regard to the the people at that time uh, by understanding their beliefs at that time we would have a rough understanding of you know we would reading matthew now we would have we would think that all right matthew is probably answering all of these objections or answering or making it clear to the people at that time excuse me right i just realized that it's almost an hour then i'm just i haven't even covered the son of david and son of abraham and we are still in the messiah 
now i'm going to look at the internal sources i'll try to rush through as fast as possible but uh those who are still watching god bless you and i hope this was this is a blessing i hope i'm not uh i'm not uh i hope it's not boring though so if it's boring you can you can always come back again and watch it but i'm going to go on to internal sources now internal sources what i mean is we're going to look at scripture in itself from scripture in itself we can also come to a certain conclusion or an understanding of the people's expectations at that time in regard to this messiah for example let's look at matthew 16 verse 22 it says here peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying god forbid it lord this shall never happen to you but he turned and said to peter get behind me satan you are a stumbling block to me and you are not setting your mind on god's interest but man's wait a minute what's this passage about this passage is about when jesus tells that he is going to be killed right in verse uh, 21 it says from that time jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to jerusalem suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day it's not only that he's going to be killed but he is going to be resurrected he's going to be raised up on the third day it's a very specific uh it's a very specific thing that jesus is revealing to his disciples but what i want to focus here is that peter rebuked him and said god forbid it this will never happen to you then in itself shows that peter has an understanding of this coming because they had no problem affirming that jesus is the messiah they at after a certain point they believed because peter himself said that you are the son of god right before this passage right in in the book of mark as well if not mistaken he goes on to say that in in one passage he says that you are the son of god when jesus asked peter uh, who do you think i am and jesus says this the father has revealed this to you and the very next passage goes on to say that and peter rebukes jesus or he goes against jesus and says that this will never happen to you so they had an expectation that jesus the messiah would not be one who is going to suffer so they had an expectation that the messiah is going to come is going to be glorious who going to be is going to be one who is uh he is going to be a king he is going to build a new kingdom and that makes sense as well in the sense of uh Jesus being called as the son of David because Jesus also calls himself many times as being one who is the son of David right and their understanding to that would be wait a minute the the messiah the messiah ben david like as i've read earlier right was one to be glorious not suffering so that aligns as, as well with scripture in that sense shows that the apostles themselves had an understanding that wait a minute Jesus is the son of David he is not supposed to suffer and he and Peter out of his ignorance rebukes Jesus so Jesus himself corrects him and say look this is not what you, you are not putting things on God's interest that's one passage there are a lot of other passage let's look at Luke 24 25 It says here Jesus speaks here and he said to them O foolish man and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory so again there is this belief that they did not understand that the messiah is going to suffer this messiah especially Jesus himself probably because they understood that he is the son of David so they had this this warped belief or this this not very uh they did they did not have a, a a clear understanding of the role of messiah but jesus corrects them and say it it's it wasn't it necessary for the messiah the word christ is messiah to suffer these things and he's alluding to the prophets so he's saying that the old testament is speaking about the messiah who will suffer why are you not expecting that that is the expectation one of the expectation from scripture we find is though they have an expectation of a kingly messiah jesus is also showing so uh, showing them the flip side of it that look jesus uh, the, the the messiah who is coming as well is is the one who is going to suffer right and this is not what i'm just saying by myself but this is 
your own books so he's teaching them as well uh we go to the very same passage in very same chapter in verse 44 and 40 to 46 now he said to them these are my words which i spoke to you while i was with you that all things which are written about me in the law of moses prophets and the psalms must be fulfilled so everything in the old testament must be fulfilled about him who is the messiah then he opened their minds to understand the scripture 46 and he said to them thus it is written that the messiah or the christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day and the repentance of forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from jerusalem you are witnesses of these things and so forth right okay so the whole idea here is jesus is not just saying this he's saying that look everything written about me written about the messiah has to be fulfilled and what's written there that the messiah or the christ would suffer rise again on the third day he's going to be killed and he's going to be raised from the is going to rise from the dead on the third day x3 17 18 this is interesting because x is written by paul paul himself is one who rebelled against the church uh seek to destroy the church but later on became one of the one of the the core apostles of of christianity right he goes on to say here in chapter 3 verse 17 it says and now brethren i know that you acted in ignorance just as your rulers did also speaking about their ignorance but the things which god announced beforehand god announced beforehand through the old testament through their scriptures by the mouth of all the prophets that his christ would suffer that his messiah god's messiah that, that god is going to send his messiah would suffer he has thus fulfilled jesus has fulfilled that expectation so paul himself is telling them look you are ignorant just as your rulers are ignorant the old testament was speaking of a messiah who is going to suffer and that person is jesus and he fulfilled all of these things right there are also other passages uh, for example isaiah 53 I wouldn't I uh, please do go and read the whole thing but the whole idea of this passage is the suffering servant who is the messiah as i as i as we went through the targum of Jonathan earlier the early understanding of that passage is clear that it was about the messiah and it goes on to say that this messiah is one who bore our griefs he carried our sorrows yet he was stricken smitten of god and afflicted he was pierced through for our transgression he was crushed for our iniqu- iniquities the chastening for our well being fell upon him do understand this is written 5 600 years before christ before jesus even came and if you read isaiah 53 you'd be even a, even a non christian reading this would immediately think this is about jesus until they understand that this is written 600 years before jesus right uh that's one passage we can also look at passages like psalm 22 speaking about uh the suffering of the messiah uh there are also other passages like Deuter- uh, deuteronomy chapter 18 speaking about a prophet uh like moses god is going to send a prophet like moses as well there's also isaiah chapter 9 that's that's even more interesting i'm not going to skip that let's go and read that as well which which makes uh makes this study even more interesting it goes on to speak about this son who is going to come this promised son that is going to come in isaiah 9 chapter 6 uh, chapter 9 verse 6 for a child will be born to us so it is a human child is going to be born a son will be given to us what will happen is that this that the government will rest upon his shoulders and his name and when you talk about name it's an attribute as well of that person this child will have this name this attribute he'll be called wonderful counselor mighty god mighty god this son this human is mighty god eternal father prince of peace right again the word eternal father does not mean that uh Jesus is the father as lot of oneness would understand that uh people who believe in oneness uh would say that would point to this passage to show that Jesus is the eternal father uh that's simply not what it is maybe i'll leave a link to one of the videos that i've posted 
some time ago in regard to this that would make it clear uh, on this passage however this passage is clear in showing that jesus or the child that is going to be born is the wonderful counselor mighty god eternal father prince of peace it goes on to say that this child though being human he is not only human he also has the attributes uh, he also has divine attributes going to show that this person is human and god is fully human and is fully god goes back to uh, one of the sessions that i did on the two natures of jesus christ the hypostatic union in regard to the the, the nature of jesus christ the two natures that is uh, that is how held on by the person of jesus christ so jesus is fully god fully man and one of those passages we find is here so there is this expectation from this passage as well that this child that is going to be born is god himself and matthew actually points that out in the study that we're going to again we are going to look at all of this because right after the genealogy what do you find right what do you find right after the genealogy he speaks about the conception of birth of jesus what does matthew allude to he says blessed behold the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son and they shall call his name immanuel which translate means god with us god with us he is taking this from uh, from isaiah as well from i uh we read through isaiah 9 earlier this is from isaiah 7 if i'm not mistaken yeah let me check this link isaiah 7 was 14 right so he's alluding to that that's why i we went through that passage as well so simply he means here that even though jesus is the messiah from the lineage of david and abraham he is also immanuel he is god with us he is god right so there is this idea here it's in itself in the beginning in itself we find that projects the understanding or theology of jesus being human fully human and also fully god that's one and obviously as i said earlier the book of daniel book of daniel chapter 7 we find this as well here it shows the son of man I kept looking in uh, Daniel 7:13 it says I kept looking in the night vision and behold with the clouds of heaven one like a son of man so they saw someone who is like a son of man someone is human but he's more than that right he is not he is not saying that they are not the, the passage is not just saying that he is a son of man but he's like a son of man he has qualities or attributes that shows that he's human he's coming he's coming to the ancient of days in this context speaks of the father was presented before him and to him was given dominion glory and kingdom wait a minute this one like a son of man all glory and kingdom is going to be with him which this son of man is distinct from the ancient of days who is the father yet he is given all glory and kingdom where only god can have all these attributes so thus all these passages though we are talking about jesus uh, specifically about jesus the messiah we also understand why the traditional or the, the the orthodox belief of christianity in the doctrine of trinity because of all these passages we are forced or we are we 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 had to come to the conclusion that the god that we serve is a triune god the father the son and the holy spirit right it's because of these passages that shows the distinction between the father and the son and the holy spirit of course here we don't find the holy spirit Uh, the aspect of the holy spirit we find that in other passages uh, even in matthew as well but because of this distinction and also the and also the unity of this three person as being one being called god that's why we come to this conclusion but i had a i have a lot of sessions on the trinity please do go and check that out as well but the whole idea here is right i guess i will stop here in regard to the word messiah we still have to go through the idea of the son of david and son of abraham the whole idea of this expectation that uh, that we as we just read right from bible from the passages in scripture and also from uh, extra biblical sources from outside of the bible from jewish tradition we find there was this expectation of a messiah coming uh, though the traditional belief of the jews they had different views as well they had multiple messiahs and all that all of that but we find that the whole idea of 
this gospel as well or, or matthew writing here is to in a way straighten things out is to reveal what jesus has taught them and said that look the laws and the prophets the, the old testament always spoke of the messiah coming and suffering he has to suffer he has to die and he has to be he and he will rise again on the third day so we find this expectation we find also passages in the book of acts and luke and so forth uh that shows that jesus himself was correcting the apostles themselves in regard to the old testament so now we have not only understanding of matthew chapter 1 we have an understanding of the people at that time we understand they had these different views and high probability that that matthew is writing this to straighten things out to to affirm that jesus is indeed the messiah there's only one messiah there's no two messiahs there's only one messiah in fact if you read the whole book of matthew you find that it's one messiah that has two coming he going to come he came in the first time and there's going to be a future coming that he's going to come the second time rather than being two messiahs it is only one messiah and that messiah is jesus now that now that i've covered that let's go to the next point next point is that jesus is the son of david it's also interesting that jesus uh is the son of abraham abraham is the patriarch and then we come to david but when you look at the way matthew wrote this he specifically wrote that he is the son of david first and the son of abraham uh i believe for practical reason because when he started the genealogy he started with abraham so it it sings back the way he write the way he formatted it it looks neat right it, he's the son of david the son of abraham and then he starts from abraham was the father of isaac and isaac was the father of jacob and so forth and so on so probably that would be the reason uh to format it in such a way that it 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 is neat i there could be people who over analyze this and go above that but i i guess i will just stick with that right but more than that let's understand what it means to be called the son of david and the son of abraham not in the normal sense of the jewish people or the 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 people who actually had a lineage with david and abraham uh calling themselves the son of david and son of abraham but in a very specific use of the son of david son of abraham to the messiah there was a very specific use to this person who called the messiah and here called jesus right so when we talk about the son of david Jesus was the fulfillment of God's covenant with David. And what was God's covenant with David? For us to understand that, we would need to go and study the book of Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7, and also the parallel passage to this is the book of Chronicles uh chapter 1 verse 17. Um we will look at that right after this, right? uh there are a few interesting things that you would find here uh as i've said some things are written in chronicles are not written in samuel's or kings uh so the in a way the book of chronicles complements the book of kings and samuel uh i'm not sure why it's that way but i guess that's how it is because i guess that's the pattern as well for example in the new testament we have four gospels a lot of things in this four gospels we find certain accounts that are there in all the gospels but there are also certain accounts that have additional information on a certain account for example the genealogy of jesus is not found in any other gospels except matthew and luke and even then luke has a different genealogy why luke has a different genealogy of jesus a very good question as well which we will not go through in this session i guess that in itself needs another session and the i guess to put it briefly one of the common understanding is the book of luke focuses on the line of mary and the book of matthew focuses on the line of joseph one of the reasons you can see is that even in the book of matthew you find the angel coming to joseph the annunciation to joseph that there is going to be a child born through mary but the angel comes to joseph in luke it comes to mary Uh, the the angel comes to mary so it's not it's not the question whether did the angel come to joseph or mary but in fact it the angel came to both of them but matthew decided to show the joseph side 
and Luke on Mary's side. And Luke has a lot of uh, emphasis on Mary as well, which is interesting. Uh, there are a lot of things as well I like to share, but I guess that's for another session. So, in regard to the son of, so as I said, there this pattern is is not unique to Samuel's Kings and Chronicles. Even in the New Testament, we find that right. The, the 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 gospels themselves are similar in some sense but distinct also in their own right in the same way samuel kings and chronicles complement one another as well there are things written in kings or chronicles not written in samuel or they they miss they they there are things that are not included there which could have been orally uh passed down throughout their tradition which is which is very plausible because at that time not everyone had scrolls uh, and it would have been an oral tradition of the covenant of david the covenant of abraham and they they would have remembered all of this they would have, even the people at that time would have a better memory in understanding scripture than compared to us right now because we have all of this technology so there are pro and cons to all of this right technology in itself so now when we look at second samuel chapter 7 god's covenant with david I'll briefly read here and emphasize on certain things. For the sake of time, I'll try to go through as fast as possible. Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David. Uh, why? Because David wanted to build a house and uh, build a house for God, a temple for God, and this uh, and God use uses Nathan to speak to David and says, "Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture." pay attention i'm not because because it's a it's a long passage pay attention to what god says right the way he says i will do this i'm the one who do this i'm the one who saved you i'm the one who brought you out of the pasture i am just pay attention to that because i'm not going to repeat this more than once hopefully because it's 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 quite long so it says here i will make you i will make you a great name because remember the whole idea is david wants to do something for god and jesus and god himself says through nathan and says i will make you a great name like the names of great men who are on the earth i will appoint also appoint a place for my people israel and will plant them and that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly even from the day that i commanded judges to be over my people israel and i will give you rest I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house which that in itself is interesting. Let me just check something here. Yeah. The Lord here simply means Jehovah, right? Which is interesting because it says Jehovah declares to you that Jehovah will make a house for you. Obviously, we are not saying that this in itself is a proof text for Trinity, but certainly is in in a way it's odd to say that right so it's passages that they, like this that lead us to that doctrine of trinity as well there's something that i wanted to point out to you as well so it's the uh, the lord also declares to you that the lord will make a house for you okay he goes on to say when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers i will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and i will establish his kingdom he shall build a house for my name i will establish the throne of his kingdom so though he will build a house i god himself will establish the throne of his kingdom forever pay attention to verse 13 right i will establish the throne of his kingdom forever okay his kingdom right i will be the father to him he will be a son to me when he commit commits iniquity i will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men but my wicked my loving kindness sorry save me from error lord misreading it but my loving kindness my loving kindness shall not depart from him as i took it from away from Saul whom i removed from before you your house okay pay attention to this your house your kingdom your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever your throne shall be established forever your house your kingdom will be before me forever your throne shall be established forever 
speaking to David here in accordance with all these words all and all this vision so Nathan spoke to David so Nathan told all of this to David what God has revealed to Nathan so it's your house speaking to David your house your kingdom is going to be somebody from your lineage that is going to do this now we'll go to also pay attention to this when he commits iniquity i will correct him with the rod of men and strokes of the sons of men obviously though this is a messianic passage uh people have uh though this is a messianic passage if in, in the old testament this is something common that we find in the old testament even prophecies have different levels of um how do i put it fulfillment different levels of fulfillment right there are partial fulfillment and there are also the even prophecies are written in such a way to the immediate context of the passage and also to a to a future expectation as well so when it comes to when he commits iniquity some if you if you have read any commentaries as well there are differing views when it comes to this some would harmonize it in a way and say that look it it speaks of what the messiah when it comes to jesus it's not him that commits iniquity but the iniquity of others that was put on him so that could be one understanding there also another the other understanding that goes on to say that the whole idea is this passage is speaking about the immediate effect and also the future understanding i tend to have that view that the passage has an immediate context and also a future expectation that is my view so that when when it comes to this passage it's re- in regard to the 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 immediate lineage of david in regard to solomon and his sons as well because this does come true because when you talk about when you read the book of kings right after david solomon the kingdom splits and the more they went against god rebelled against god served baal and served pagan gods by the end of it they were being corrected by god many times right up to the point that they were just sent to exile god even used a pagan nation to come and take them away right so god was fair god is fair to all nations to the jewish people and to gentiles as well and in this passage i tend to believe that this has a immediate context and also a future uh, future expectation as well so when it comes to the future under expectation i believe that this does not necessarily refer to the messiah it speaks about the the immediate effect but when it comes to the other parts of the passage it alludes to the messiah and i have actually a reason why i come to this conclusion because of chronicles now we'll go to the book of chronicles chapter 17 let me check my notes I can easily miss this um god's covenant with david so this is a parallel passage so if you would like to do an exercise uh, by yourself uh, in your own time as well or even now take these two passages put on two windows right and if you're using a computer or anything like that you're using open up two windows and put these two passages and just go verse by verse and you'll start to see minor differences right what what is omitted in in samuel chronicles adds in that to to give you a fuller view of that covenant right so it goes on to say i'm going to read again only once again it says and it came about when david dwelt in his house then david said to nathan the prophet behold i'm dwelling in a house of cedar but the ark of covenant of the lord is under curtains then nathan said to david do all that is in your heart for god is with you uh okay i will start here in verse 4 go and tell david my servant thus says jehovah thus says the lord you shall not build a house for me to dwell in for again again you see the same thing i have i have not dwelt in a house since the day that i brought israel to this day brought up israel to this day but i have gone from tent to tent and from one dwelling place to another in all places where i have walked with all israel have i spoken a word with any of the judges of israel whom i commanded to shepherd my people saying why have you not built for me a house of cedar Now therefore thus shall you say to my servant David thus says the Lord of hosts I took you from the pasture from following the sheep to be a leader over my people Israel I have been with you whenever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you and I will make you a name like the name of the great ones who are in the earth 
I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and not be moved again and the wicked will not waste them any more as formerly even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and I will subdue all your enemies moreover I tell you that the Lord I tell you that Jehovah the Lord will build a house for you when your days are fulfilled your days are fulfilled you must go to be with your fathers that i will set up one of your descendants after you who will be of your sons so it's going to be a literal a person who is going to come in the lineage of david and i will establish his kingdom he shall build for me a house and i will establish his throne forever pay attention to the last part right i will be his father he shall be my son and i will not take my loving kindness away from him first point he does not include the iniquity part here right i'm going to show you a little diagram later on something that i just prepared uh, just to make my point but chronicles doesn't include that does it mean that it doesn't affirm that that was there in the passage no it simply means that it's already covered in samuel chronicles is going to give you the other part of it. it's going to give you the other side of the story something that was not there right he goes on to say as i took it from him who was before you but i will settle him in my house and in i will settle i will settle him the, the coming seed of david in my house my kingdom forever and his throne shall be established forever if you were to look carefully in samuel it's your house your kingdom but in chronicles it's written as my house my kingdom and his throne so there is a distinction between god and this coming seed who's through david but that kingdom that house is also god's house it's not you see that this the house of the house of the messiah the kingdom the throne of the messiah is also god's kingdom is god's throne and it's god's house there's a syn- the synon the being synonymous of this person messiah and god himself we see a connection there uh, the differences from samuel and chronicles and talking about chronicles as i've said let me see if i can bear with me uh, i'm going to take a snapshot of this no it's too small Hold on guys let me see if i can right okay uh this is not exactly perfect but at least you would be able to have a picture of this like if you see this boxes here right if you see this boxes these are the times uh, or at least the periods where this book was written for example this is the period where samuel was written this was the time where kings were written and this was this is the timeline where pro, the possible timeline of when chronicles was written samuel covers this this timeline it's written at this timeline but it covers the history of this timeline between samuel being born to david's kingship when it comes to book of kings though written at this timeline uh, at this point of history it is covering this historical period the, the, the during the time of kings during the time when israel had kings from david solomon uh, and all of the kings the split of the kingdom between northern and the southern kingdom chronicles on the other hand is written during the post exilic period as i've said earlier it's after the time of kings after they have been exiled and they are going to come back and that's when they had the second temple the building of the second temple that's when they wrote chronicles interestingly chronicles covers the whole history from the beginning because it starts from adam right the, the whole genealogy starting from adam right up to the return to jerusalem from the beginning right up to the time to the return to jerusalem the whole history of israel up to that point so now uh if if why am i showing that is to show you that 
wait a minute they have the people of israel they already had an idea or an expectation of the coming messiah they already had an expectation of the coming messiah as we have gone through they already know they they have an idea they already know that the son of david is going to come his kingdom is going to be forever however they also understand that through the experience of the exile they understood that god has also fulfilled his promise or fulfilled his warning to his people in fact that if they commit iniquity that if this king's commit iniquity goes against god that he is going to discipline them in one way or another and in this his in their history they were brought to exile so for the very fact that in chronicles they omitted that part and they omitted the part where it says that uh if he commits iniquity uh uh that god is going to also discipline this seed of david goes to show that the people in in the at least the, the writer or the uh, the writer of chronicles inspired by the holy spirit is showing in one in one way that that wasn't something in regard to the actual kingdom I mean, the true messiah comes he would fulfill everything about god he would fulfill everything in regard to his kingdom that his kingdom will be established forever his kingdom will never be exiled his kingdom will never be broken his kingdom will be forever the glory and dominion will be forever for eternity so they understood that covenant had a more deeper implication and they understood and they were expecting that and that glory is what glory that they were expecting in the second temple but they never found it right and and during that time until the time of coming of jesus there was this deep longing and expectation for that long awaited messiah that messiah that they were waiting for they were yearning for was that expectation that they had for this messiah so they had an expectation of the messiah though not necessarily being a very uh how to say a, a perfect understanding of that but they had this expectation so through that's why i understand the passage in that sense uh that cro- by reading chronicles and samuel we get a picture that chronicles in itself focuses as i've said chronicles focuses in the lineage of david the kingship of david and the the the, the kingdom of juda specifically because that was the promise for juda and david that a scepter that will go before them these are passages that i will go i will come by later on in, a, in another session as we go through the genealogy there are going to be more things that are going to be unpacking here or we are going to be exploring in so that it's very specific reason gene- the genealogy was there in chronicles as well why did he focus on the line of david because they had this expectation of the coming of the messiah through this covenant and by matthew saying that look this jesus is the son of david he's affirming he's saying that is fulfilled in the person of jesus christ that jesus in fact is the messiah that you will be you are longing for he is the long awaited messiah he has come and he has revealed himself to us so he is the son of david so now we have covered the son of david we had there are a lot of things that i probably would have skipped through uh for the sake of time because i still have one more to go through the son of abraham which is also interesting right when you talk about the son of david we are talking about a king who is going to come through the seed of david and his his kingdom is going to be forever and again i'm going to remind you the the differences we find in samuel and kings in samuel it's your throne your kingdom in chronicles sorry in chronicles it's my house my kingdom goes to show that ultimately this kingdom and house or this throne is god's throne is god's kingdom it's not just a, a, a seed or the son of man coming it's not just a human seed of david but it's more than that this kingdom is going to belong to god because he himself is going to be our king right uh looking at these differences i tend to to come to that conclusion and belief and conviction now let's look at the idea of the messiah being son of abraham excuse me let me just string my
my throat is parched right <clears throat> this would be the final part of my my this session today so hopefully in the next 20 minutes we can wrap things up let's talk about son of abraham now we have looked at uh, jesus being the messiah we looked at genealogy we have looked at being jesus being the son of david um, we have covered all of those passages now let's talk about son of abraham now again i've said the jewish people at that time even now they have no problem calling themselves son of abraham they were all sons of abraham the the 12 tribes come from that line from the line of abraham the 12 tribes the, the, the patriarchs from abraham isaac and jacob it's from that lineage so the for the jewish people they have no problem calling themselves son of abraham it does not make them more than who they are it just goes to show that they are from that lineage but we as we have seen here matthew is not using it in a very general sense that he is the son of abraham in that sense because why would he do that because it's obvious that he is a son of abraham as a jew he is born as a jew they had no problem understanding that jesus is a jew they understood that he is a jew they understood that he is from nazareth they understood all of these things they even there are also passages in the new testament that show that that they understood that he is the son of joseph and mary the son of the carpenter right there are all all these passages there so they, they there's no issue in the sense that Jesus is the son of Abraham in that general sense. But obviously Matthew is not trying to say that. I mean why go through all that trouble to show that Jesus is the son of Abraham just in the general sense? Because if the whole idea here is to prove the whole idea of the genealogy is to show to justify that Jesus is one the Messiah according to the covenant with David. So immediately it has to be the reason in regard to he is the son of abraham in regard to him being the fulfillment of god's covenant with abraham what is god's covenant with abraham we we'll look at few passages right start with genesis 12 genesis chapter 12 verses 1 to 3 is a, is a point in time where abraham's name is not even abraham yet it's abram right and it says here now the lord Yehova said to Abraham go forth from your country and from the relatives and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you and I will make you a great nation first promise of God to Abraham he's going to make Abraham his people a great nation first one second one I will bless you he's going to there is a blessing over this lineage of Abraham three and make your name great and so you shall be a blessing it's not that he will bless abraham but abraham himself will be a blessing to others and i will bless those who bless you and to the one who curses you i will curse and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed wait a minute through abraham god is going to use this person uh, abram right before his name became abraham and through him all the families of of the earth all the nations of the earth is going to be blessed through abraham so here we find uh the initial part of god's promise to abraham specifically to abraham then we go to another interesting passage in genesis 17 as i've said because we though we are studying the book of matthew we are going to look a, we're going to look back a lot of passages in the old testament i believe by the time we finish the book of matthew we probably would have gone through a huge chunk of the old testament as well so genesis 17 is the as the title goes to show abraham and the covenant of circumcision uh let's see which part i would like to focus on because it's a long passage okay let's just read through right now when abraham uh, sorry now when abram was 99 years old the lord appeared to abraham abram and said to him i am god almighty walk before me and be blameless i will i will establish my covenant between me and you and i will multiply you exceedingly so what's the covenant between god and uh, abraham that he's going to multiply 
Abraham, Abram at that time exceedingly. It's going to make his kingdom big, which which you know Abram is going to, as you're going to see, he's going to have, he's going to laugh on on, on that on that issue because he does not have children. He doesn't have his own children yet. In verse three, it goes on to say, Abram fell on his face and God talked with him, saying, "As for me, behold, my covenant is with you." you will be a father of multitude of nations with a minute abram one of the covenant the covenant is that abram will be a father to many nation multitude of nation no longer shall your name be called abram but your name shall be called abraham for i will make you a father of multitude of nations so the name change in itself goes to show the meaning of the word abraham that he is going to be a father of many nations father of multitude of nations so the name change is just a physical or it's just a change of name to show god's covenant and promise to abraham that he's going to make him a father to many nations goes on to say i have made you exceedingly fruitful and i'll make nations of you and kings will come forth from you i will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be god to your descendants after you i will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings all the land of canaan for an everlasting possession i will and i will be their god again this covenant as i've said prophecies and covenant has an immediate effect and also a a future fulfillment as well right so we see this as something that is going to happen immediately or in, in or in that context in history but also later on later on in history for the for for the coming of christ goes on to say in verse 9 god said further to abraham now as for you you shall keep my covenant you and your descendants after you throughout their generation this is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you every male among you shall be circumcised So this is the covenant of circumcision. Circumcision itself is a sign, a seal of that covenant. Why circumcision? I believe because from this context, it seems to indicate this covenant is not a covenant just to Abraham, but it's to the people of Israel, to the covenant of to the lineage of Abraham. It's an everlasting covenant to the lineage of Abraham and to all the nations actually, because it's through this Abraham that all nations will be blessed. that he's going to be father of many nation so circumcision is uh, it's an outward expression of a reality a spiritual reality that this covenant is for an everlasting kingdom a, a future generation or an everlasting generation goes on to say in verse 11 and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you was 12 and every male among you who is 8 days old shall be circumcised throughout your generation a servant who is born in the house who is brought money from any foreigner who is not of your descendants servant who is born of in your house who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant but an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin that person shall be cut off from his people he has broken my covenant then it goes on to say it's not only abraham but it's also for sarai or sara then god said to abraham as for sarai your wife you shall not call her name sarai but sara shall be her name why because i will bless her and indeed i will give you a son by her then i will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations abraham the father of nations sara the mother of nations kings of peoples will come from her 17 then abraham shall uh, sorry then abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart will a child be born to a man 100 years old and will sara who is 99 eh, sorry 9 90 years old bear a child and abraham said to god oh that ishmael might live before you but god said no but sara your wife will bear you a son and you shall call his name isaac and i'll establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him As for Ishmael I have heard you behold I bless him and will make him fruitful and multiply him exceedingly he shall become the father of 12 princes and I will make him a great nation but my covenant I will establish with Isaac whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year and when he finished talking to him God went up from Abraham okay so 
this covenant was specific to Abraham that is going to be a specific person coming from Abraham and Sarah not like Ishmael right it's going to be the son of the covenant a promise son of the promise Isaac right we're going to look more on Isaac on the next the very next session where I'm going to cover on the patriarchs uh, but in this session circumcision here though being something that is shown in flesh a physical um, of something that is done physically but it also has a deeper reality to it right for example circumcision though is done in that form uh, in a physical form it has the, the true circumcision is always the circumcision of the heart and and though this is uh, this is a bit off topic but i like to focus on this as well uh, I, I, maybe i because it's already more than 1 hour 47 minutes i'll just point you to those passages from my notes right do go and read jeremiah chapter 4 verse 4 it shows that circumcision is a circumcision of heart it's what god is looking for that's the true meaning of it right deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 16 leviticus chapter 26 verse 39 and last romans chapter 2 verse 25 maybe i'll just read the new testament one in the book of romans Romans chapter 2 verse 25 to 29 it says here for indeed circumcision is of value if you practice the law but if you are a transgressor of the law your circumcision has become uncircumcision so if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirement of the law will not his circum- uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision as he who is physically uncircumcised if he keeps the law will he not judge you who though having the letter of the law and circumcision are a transgressor of the law for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh but he is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit not by the letter and his praise is not from man but from god so here itself we find uh, circumcision uh, as an idea or as a sign or in a seal of the covenant but is a physical expression of a deeper reality a, a spiritual reality right so god himself if you read deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 6 god himself will circumcise the hearts of his people so that they may love god with all their heart mind and so read that in deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 6 now i'll move on to the next passage that speaks about god's covenant to Abraham lost my thought there again long passage but i'm almost done here genesis chapter 2 verse 1 to 18 it says now it came about after these things that god tested abraham and said to him abraham and he said here i am this is the time when he already has isaac right he said take now your son your only son whom you love isaac and go to the land of moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which i will tell you that in itself is interesting the land of moriah do go and search that out i'll be covering that in the future sessions very interesting in regard to the land of moriah and the genealogy as well so abraham rose early was 3 so abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and isaac his son and he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which god had told him on the third day abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance abraham said to his young man stay here with the donkey and i and the lad will go over there and will worship and return to you god took the wood and wood of the burnt offering and laid it abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on isaac his son he took it he took in his hand the fire and the knife So the two of them walked on together. Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, "My father," and he said, "Here I am, my son." And he said, "Behold the fire of the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering?" Abraham said, "God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son." So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son but the angel of the lord called to him from heaven and said abraham abraham and he said here i am he said do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him for now i know that you fear god since you have not withheld your son your only son from me 
Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, or the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and from heaven and said, "By myself I have sworn." declares the lord because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son your only son indeed i god will greatly bless you i will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore and your seed your seed hold bookmark this in your mind right keep this in your mind your seed shall possess the gate of the enemies In your seed all the nation of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. In regard to verse 17 and 18 There are a lot of things to unpack here but I want to focus on on this very fact here. Your seed shall possess the gate of enemies. The word seed here is singular. It's to a specific seed of Abraham. Your seed in your seed all the nations are again the promise of god the covenant of god to abraham was was what was that through abraham all nations will be blessed that is through abraham that all the blessings the blessings to all the kingdoms will come and he will be the father of many nations right here it says that in your seed all the nations shall be blessed so that through abraham and through this very seed of abraham this very person that is going to come in the line of abraham and through him all the nations of the earth not just the jewish people but all the nations of the earth everyone will be blessed through this seed because of through because of abraham obeying god's voice so abraham returned to his young men and okay he goes on to say about the other thing i'm just going to stop there so singular your seed this seed and through this seed all the nations shall be blessed let's go to galatians chapter 3 uh, verse 16 it goes on to say now the promises were spoken to this paul speak paul is writing to the galatians he's saying now the promises were spoken to abraham and to his seed he does not say god did not say to seeds he does not say to many seeds he's not he's talking about it's not talking about plural that's what paul was paul is trying to justify paul is trying to argue here he does not say and to seeds as referring to many but rather to one so that passage what we find here is an apostolic interpretation of the old testament a divine uh, inspired commentary of the old testament we have commentaries today that are written by many people uh, most of the commentaries are basically i wouldn't even i wouldn't even there are a lot of commentaries that i think you should not even bother reading but the but what i'm saying is all those commentaries today we are having from they are not inspired commentaries in that sense right they are, they could be enlightened by the writings of the apostles but here we find an inspired commentary on the old testament through paul's letter to galatians and paul is arguing from the old testament he's saying that promise that was given to abraham was through his seed and he did not say to seeds as if referring to many seeds but to a specific seed who's that seed he just reveals it here blank a uh, blank i mean directly he says that seed is christ that is christ that is messiah what god was promising to abraham that a messiah is going to come through him that this seed through his seed all nations shall be blessed i guess that's really neat right so when jesus is called the son of abraham matthew was not saying in a general sense that he is the son of abraham because there was no need for that but he was saying that this is that promise of god to abraham that that through this seed all nations shall be blessed and that seed is messiah and that messiah is jesus now i was speaking about the land of moriah earlier right that's where abraham 
was told to take his son Isaac to that place. Uh, the whole account there is an actually a foreshadowing of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus being the only son of God, the only begotten son of God. Uh, Isaac also well being the only son of uh, the only son of Abraham, right? The the only promised son to Abraham in that sense, right? And Jesus being the only son of God, there is this correlation between the, the the whole idea of that account of Abraham and Isaac is a foreshadowing of something more something a fuller picture of the Messiah, right? And speaking of the land of Moriah, which is interesting because it's in that area, one of the hills that Abraham took Isaac to sacrifice. One of one of the promises that uh, let me just. Uh, in case if I misread it, let me just. It says here that place that that very area it will be called Jehovah Jireh. In the mount of the Lord it will be provided. It's speaking about that place and it this sacrifice, this actual sacrifice that's going to take place later on in history will be provided in this area which is interesting because in in Matthew's genealogy in Matthew's genealogy what he did what did he do with his genealogy he breaks it between Abraham and David speaking about the covenant of Abraham to David that genealogy and then you have David right up to the uh, being exiled to Babylon and from the time of the return of or from the time of being exiled right up to Jesus the Messiah. And if you just looked in, in the sense of the land Moriah, Abraham, the promise, the covenant of God to Abraham was in that land of Moriah. Later on, when David, the second side of 14th generation, David himself, when he was when he wanted to have a land for Solomon to build the temple, was also a place around the land of Moriah as well, that same place where they were going to do sacrifices, uh, yearly sacrifices. And interestingly, when Jesus was crucified, the Messiah himself was crucified in Golgotha. That area in itself is known to be around the land of Moriah, that same place, that same area in itself, fulfilling God's covenant that in this mount, it will be provided in this uh, in in this place it will be provided that in, that 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 sacrifice for all nation to be blessed will be provided so i guess that sums up matthew chapter 1 verse 1 it's very short verse but looking back into the old testament and also in the history of the jewish people and the expectation of the messiah i guess now we have a deeper appreciation at least for what matthew was trying to convey here as I've said, like as I said, when you're talking about the land of Moriah and I see these neat things happening throughout scripture, in the sense of the land of Moriah being the place where Isaac was to be sacrificed. And then we see that David used that land as well for uh, the coming temple. And then later on, Jesus himself was crucified somewhere in that very area as well. Which is just neat. I mean, like, I mean, what are the chances of that happening, right? So I could be in a sense, I could be over uh, reading into the text in, in this point. So I'm just going to say that. So do take it with a grain of salt. That could be a, a neat thing, but I just think that it's neat. I, I guess that I, there's, a, there's definitely a significance to it as well. Uh, but yeah, I guess we just went through chapter 1 verse 1. And I'm going to stop there. Stop here. Uh, uh, just to recap, we have covered why genealogies are used it makes sense that Matthew as he is writing to a Jewish audience he's writing a genealogy and and it and genealogy in itself is not just in lineage but it also used as a tool to convey other elements that are in play in, in regards to the narrative and the genealogy here is speaking about this person called Jesus and he goes on to give three reasons uh, or, or he goes on to affirm who this person Jesus is one, he is the Messiah. Two, he is the son of David. Three, he is the son of Abraham. And now we have understood 
at least in some context we have understood these things i believe that now going into the genealogy we're going to have much more fun there right we're going to we're going to have a much deeper understanding in 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 the genealogy in itself now that we know that this genealogy is not necessarily just about the lineage of jesus it's more than that there's more things in play in regard to the person of jesus christ and what matthew was trying to convey to his audience through the, his gospel to the gospel according to saint matthew with that i think i will end there in the next session i'm also going to just go through one verse and that's that's the last time i'm going to just see by one verse because after that i'm going to go by passages right i'm going to go maybe chunks of passages and we will start covering a bigger portion of passages but the whole idea of the next session is i'm going to cover on the patriarchs abraham isaac and jacob what was as i said we are going to go back to genesis we are going to spend a lot of time in genesis understanding this three patriarchs the the patriarchs of israel abraham isaac and jacob what was god's covenant with them we're going to look back at a few things that we have already gone through in this session more than that we are also going to see in regard to isaac and jacob uh their life they are Uh, in how god communicated with them there are a lot of interesting accounts there in genesis as well so i hope that session will be uh, approximately 2 weeks from now uh, with that i hope if you like this type of sessions i understand these are long form sessions and i do take my time explaining and it can be boring could put you to sleep as well but i hope that this was a blessing if it's too long do watch it in parts i will be putting the time stamps underneath later on so that you can go to the specific parts uh, if you want to you know read if you want to go and watch at a specific point of time so with that uh go in peace and serve the lord and god bless right so i'm just going to end it right here god bless